I mean, I think over the next two years, and right now, the reason I say that crisis is here is because it's it's not something that just happens overnight, right? Breaching covenants and and refinancing and you know these trends in in um, flight away from commercial real estate are not you know they take time to materialize. But I think right now it's it's really at at the early to mid stages. We're talking macro today with Adam Kobesi. He is the founder and editor in chief of the Kobesi Letter, a very popular online macro research shop. We can follow his work on Twitter and in the link down below. Welcome to the show, Adam. Good to see you. Good to see you too, David. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. A lot to discuss today. You've done some excellent research. I want to run through as much as possible. Let's start with some recent news coming out of today on Friday as we're speaking Friday morning Eastern time. Evergrande filed for bankruptcy where Chapter 15 of their U.S. assets, more uh, more specifically overnight. Uh, now, you were tweeting about this and you said that uh, this is a long time coming, but uh, more importantly for Americans... Uh, watching this show right now, the commercial real estate in the U.S. is beyond bear market territory, is your tweet from this morning. Office buildings alone are down 30% in one year, all while regional banks carry a 70% plus of the exposure. The CRE crisis is here. Now, Adam, I've had a lot of people on the show tell me that the CRE crisis could be coming or is, you know, the CRE sector overall is at risk for the reasons that you've described, but no one's told me that it's here already. Can you please elaborate that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's it's been a very interesting period for real estate in general. There's so many different things happening in so many different directions, but commercial real estate has been incredibly weak for the last year. I mean, as you mentioned, office buildings are down 30%, apartments are down 15%, uh, malls another 10%. So and, and all while the housing market has been rather strong, so people, it, it's kind of it's kind of hiding that that, that the commercial real estate sector is so weak. Um, and part of the reason why, why we we also believe that the crisis is already is already here. I mean, with prices down so sharply, there's a huge debt wall coming to be refinanced in 2025. This is something I pointed out a few months ago, back in March, and. Um, you know the, the the data right now shows that seventy percent of all commercial real estate loans are actually held by regional banks. I mean, the, they're held by banks outside of the top twenty five largest banks. So you have the and and when and the important point here is that this debt needs to be refinanced in in twenty twenty five. But the last time that this debt was refinanced or that it was issued, interest rates were well below where we are now. So you have this period of time where interest rates are rising at their fastest pace in recent history, maybe in the fastest pace of all time, you have rates going up sharply. And then meanwhile, there's there's vacancies across a lot of commercial real estate, particularly in the office space. And the exposure to this debt um, is actually highly concentrated to regional banks, which back in March and April, we saw the regional bank crisis happen. The crisis happened. So I think there's so many different factors converging here and I, it's just very hard to see a situation where this is not a crisis. And I think things do get worse for commercial real estate. Can you please explain just in layman terms why uh, the fact that uh, commercial real estate is more vacant and prices are down could be translated into a crisis? So let me just, I'm just thinking from the other perspective here. If I were a store or a small business and I'm renting a space, most stores and businesses rent the space, they don't own the property. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. okay, the price is down. Maybe that means lower rent for me. Maybe that means more uh, higher margins for my business. What do you think? Yeah, sure. I mean, so, uh, you know, that's that's a logical way to think about it. But what you have to kind of think about it the other way around. So bit, large office buildings take a billion dollar property in Manhattan that's that has, you know, 30 floors of offices. That that building is is like a company. It generates cash flows. And the and the the, per, the company or the landlord that that runs that building uses those cash flows, which are coming from rent and other, you know, other means to basically service their debt and and operate as a business effectively. And when, like you said, it's great for the business owners that are saying, all right, now I can pay half the rent because there's not as much demand. But what happens when the when the people that own these buildings, the companies that service the debt are now receiving, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent less in income and they're, they're unable to generate enough free cash flow to pay down their debt on time. And meanwhile, the payments on these debts, as I mentioned, with 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 the the refinancing wall coming up of one point five trillion of commercial real estate loans. Um, 
the payments are going to go up sharply, right? If your interest rate doubles, your 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 payment that, that you need to, to service these debts and the, the debt and meet your covenants is going to also go up pretty sharply. So, um, you know, it might be great over the short ter- term for business owners, as you mentioned, who are, yeah, we'll pay less rent, but they're not the ones that are that are servicing this debt. They're not taking on that liability. And it, it kind of has a, the ability to become kind of a domino effect here, right? If if these uh, commercial properties start defaulting on their loans, then these small banks that are already weak have increased, have, you know, outsized exposure that that could easily cascade into another regional bank crisis and spread further from there. Are you saying that there could be a higher risk of default from the property owners of commercial real estate this year? Exactly. So, I mean, I think over the next two years and right now, the reason I say that crisis is here is because. It's, it's not something that just happens overnight, right? Breaching covenants and, and refinancing and, you know, these trends in, in um, flight away from commercial real estate are not, you know, they take time to materialize. But I think right now it's it's really at, at the early to mid stages. And um, with with the way things are trending, I mean, particularly in the office space, it, it's hard to see a, 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 a reason why these buildings will fill up again. I mean, you see the... The trend of commercial converting, you know, office buildings and other commercial into multifamily housing and and other other parts of the housing market that are actually pretty strong, but that's very expensive, very timely, and it's um, not necessarily something that can just be done quickly. So the Federal Reserve themselves have uh, re- uh, they've released a report earlier in the year indicating that seven hundred plus American banks, 722 to be exact, have suffered unrealized losses exceeding 50% of their capital, meaning that in layman terms, 700 banks, U- U.S. banks, are at risk of failure. So like you mentioned, commercial real estate is a big part of their portfolio. So what does the CRE crisis mean for the banking sector? Yeah, so that's that was that's our primary concern right now is that things can spread from one sector to the next and the regional bank crisis I think it really emphasizes the fact that a lot more consolidation is coming in the banking sector. Um the way that regulators handled the crisis as opposed to putting a industry-wide backstop temporarily on all deposits and 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 just the way it was handled they they really just let the smaller banks fail and get to the point where they're about to fail, seize them. The FDIC would seize them and then allow a larger bank like JP Morgan to step in and kind of just acquire them and, and merge. So I think that's kind of the, been the approach that they're taking going forward because they don't want to call a bailout. They don't want to incentivize um banks to take outsized risks, even though if they, they might have already done so, they don't want to incentivize it just knowing that, oh, yeah, we're going to backstop everybody in any case. So um, I think what it really means is that if if these these smaller banks start feeling the pressure, a lot more consolidation is coming and the big banks are going to get bigger. And I, I mean, that's just been the trend for the last hundred years and it's, it's probably going to continue. And I think this this risk generally highlights uh, growing bearish sentiment in the market. Well, sorry, growing bearish sentiment for some people. A lot of Wall Street banks like Bank of America now see uh, no recession at all. They're switching to a soft landing stance. But Michael Burry, uh, famous for his big short back in 2008, now apparently initiated another big short on the order of $1.6 billion. Can you just describe what exactly he did? Yeah, so we put we published um, a whole thread on this on um, on Twitter, you know, the it's it's a common misconception when these these SEC filings are published that if some if if somebody buys puts right and they disclose them they disclose the the, the nominal value of those puts so he didn't buy 1.6 billion dollars of puts he, he we did the math i mean it's hard to know cuz you don't know what the strike price and the premium paid were per option contract but it's probably somewhere around 50 to 100 million and it's hard to even say if that's a net short position. I mean, it could be a hedge for as long as he has. So, I mean, it it could be a bearish call, but we we were kind of pointing out more that it wasn't a one point six billion dollars short. And I mean, look, the the market as a whole. I mean, we've been for the majority of this year up until about last week, um, we've been pretty bullish. We we we've been long basically for the entire year because. There's so many different factors going on here 
Um, and it's it's hard to say that one thing is going to make the whole market collapse, as we've seen. There's been a million headwinds over the last two years, the last year, and markets have been pretty resilient. So we've been urging our subscribers and our followers that, look, as long as the trend is up, we're playing the trend. This week is the first time we've seen the trend reverse since early May um, as S&P broke below 4390. That was the, the most recent higher low. Um, so, you know, our view is right now we're going to see more volatility. And as long as we're below that level, it's it's pretty, pretty clear that bears are back in control over the short term. And, and that's kind of how we take, you know, we analyze all everything we cover. We take both a macro and a technical uh, viewpoint on it. And uh, I'm happy to elaborate more on that. Yeah, please do. Uh, actually, on the on the topic of Burry, earlier in the year, he tweeted a very cryptic message, sell. That's all he wrote back in January. And then in March, he said, I was wrong to say sell, uh, I think, because markets have been going up. If you look at the CFTC net speculative positions on the S&P 500, for example, the futures, it's still net short. Uh, yep. <clears throat> you're saying the bears have taken over. I like I like to understand a little bit more by what you mean. Yeah, by that because, I mean, I yeah. think the the near term trend has reversed, um, and that's not to say that we're you know it, it, there's such a tendency now that anytime you make a bearish call, it has to be that everything's about to crash and burn. I mean, that's not necessarily the case. The the you could have a ten percent pullback in a healthy bull market, right? It's it's just a correction. So I think over the short term, we're we're close to you know five six percent off the recent highs. You could see another four or five percent in 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 a drawback, um, but we're not really calling for a prolonged bear market or the S and P to drop back to its lows from October twenty twenty two. Rather, just um, a healthy pullback after a hot run. And we we had one of the hard the hottest starts to a year since the nineteen eighties this year, which completely shocked everybody. Um, and it's hard. You can't move in a straight line higher. So right now we think we're in kind of correction territory, but not necessarily a huge bear market ahead for equities. Would you we're going to move on to um, another asset class later, but what would you attribute this uh, decline from its uh, July highs to? Um, I think the Fed minutes last week were very important. I think what's happening right now is markets are not necessarily pricing in more rate hikes. So it's not a Fed pivot to the point that more rate hikes are expected. We actually don't think the Fed will raise rates at all um, going forward. I think the last rate hike was in July, but it's rather rate cuts are being pushed out further. So what the market is now viewing um, as the base case is just a long, a prolonged pause with the Fed funds rate in the uh, 525 to 550 basis point range. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's exactly why markets are pulling back. If you would have looked three, three, even two months ago, there were still rate cuts priced in this year. We at one point we had four rate cuts, rate cuts priced in in 2023 alone. Now futures are not showing any rate cuts until May of 24. It's very possible that that gets pushed back even to June or or, or later. Um, but it's uh, right now. I think the pullback is just a shift and. Uh, expectations somewhat in the hawkish direction, but not meaning that more rate hikes are coming, which is a very important um, topic to point out. Is the uh, is the ten year yield predicting uh, more rate hikes though? Because it's it's actually reaching the highest closing level since two thousand and seven. Yeah, you've tweeted about this yourself on your own Twitter, and um, it's interesting how the ten year has been closely correlated with the S and P five hundred pretty much all year. Up until two, three weeks ago. Yep. So, uh, what is the bond market, specifically the ten-year yield, signaling? Is my question. Yeah, yeah. So the the bond market has been incredibly interesting for anyone interested in macro. This is like the dream, the dream year for you. Um, where, you know, the the ten-year when we became bullish with the ten-year after it broke four percent a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, uh, and and we think it's going to go towards four point five percent in the coming weeks, and there's there's so many different things at play, but I think there's a few big topics here. Number one is what I mentioned on rate cuts being pushed out. So we're kind of, in a way, pricing in a more hawkish than expected Fed. That combined with um, an interesting point that real yields are up sharply. So real yields are actually above their, you know, way above pre-pandemic levels above and at 2007 levels. Um, which is, is rather interesting as well, because that's that's 
um, that's been driving a lot of the growth in the tenure in our in our view. And then also there is this whole um, topic that we've been very vocal on that the deficit in the U.S. Uh, has been growing rapidly with spending and, and ta- spending rising tax receipts down. So the Treasury has has the U.S. Treasury has had to issue a lot of supply over the last few uh, you know, the last few weeks and going forward this quarter alone, they're issuing a trillion dollars in, in U.S. treasuries um, and, and bonds. And in next quarter, it's it's looking like about 850 billion are expected. So it's flooding the the, the bond market with supply. Um, so there's so many different factors at play here, but those those are the big drivers. And, and it's hard to see any of those really turning around until we see the 10 year back to 4.5 percent or even higher, which is, by the way, in line with levels that we saw last time inflation spiked to, to as high as it was. So it's not out of the ordinary. You know, one thing that's in, that's actually concerning for, for me as a as a student of finance and economics, I look at the yield curve as an indicator of the rece- of a coming recession as, as most a lot of people do what's interesting to note about the yield curve is that historically it's inverted and then it has to revert back to zero before the recession officially hits uh now it's been inverted for quite a while for more than a year now adam uh but because the 10 year is now rising faster than the two year for the reasons that perhaps you stated above the yield curve has started to revert back to zero Yep. Which again, historically, is a signal that a recession is near. Do you agree? Yep. Yeah, that, it's it's incredibly interesting. Like like how that exactly what you laid out. Um, am I calling for a recession? I think in twenty twenty four, early twenty four, we're going to see some weakness. It's hard to say. I think is when you say recession, everyone thinks 08. It's not, we don't have an 08 setup happening right now. It's not 08. I think we will see a period of economic weakness. I think higher rates are starting to take their toll on consumer discretionary spending and on the economy. But um, so, so a mild recession is what we expect, not necessarily a huge crash. Um, and like you said, the 10 year is also very interesting in that. Typically, when you're expecting a recession, you actually see bond prices rise. Like, I mean, the ten-year yield should be down when you expect um, when you when when a recession is being priced in, right? And right now, the ten-year is trading like we're on maximum risk on mode, right? It's almost like we're trading like like equities, like the S and P's at five thousand. So it's 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 really interesting that the ten-year is now, you know, it has been following the S and P the entire year, and I think that also is just. An, an, a testament to how much risk appetite there is in this market up until the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it's, it's, you spelled it out perfectly. The 10-year is predicting a soft landing, or at least that's what it looks like. I don't know if it's actually predicting that, but the stock market's now trending down. So uh, it's very Crazy. confusing. <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of, it's a lot, yeah, it, it, it's, it's so bottom line now, uh, before we move on to other macro forces, what? how are you positioned or... Um, you know, you don't have to give specific picks. We can go to the Cobasi letter for that. You've actually had a pretty incredible year with your track record in 2022. Um, tell us about tell us about your track record, your process, and then yep. how you're positioned now. Absolutely. So we've been um, we're going on eight years of of running the Cobasi letter. Last year we made 86 percent, and we pr- uh, predominantly trade. The S&P commodities, which includes gold, crude oil, natural gas, and then bonds, as well as some options. Um, And most recently, also some Bitcoin we've been covering. So our approach really is to take both a fundamental and technical view on on anything that really has sufficient volume and and, and has a macro and technical take. So we started uh, when we first started using technicals uh, almost 10 years ago now. It was almost everyone kind of laughed at you. You were drawing lines on a chart. Now you see price action is so heavily correlated with technicals, especially with the rise of algorithmic and automated trading, which are following these key levels. Um, so what we do is we lay out our, our all of our setups, our trades for subscribers um, with a full technical uh, backdrop. So we'll take the, the entry price, our target, our stop loss, a full chart. And then we'll also... Uh, give um, a macro sort of justification for our view. And we don't take a trade unless our macro and technical backdrop aligns, which has really allowed us to have a high hit rate and and outperform the S&P 500 uh, for multiple years now. 
So, you know, we continue to apply that approach. And in times of volatility, it's it's been incredibly profitable. This year has been great. We haven't, pu- we publish our report at the end of each year, but it's been a great year. Um, so looking forward, like I said, we've been bullish of the S&P uh, up until this week, we actually covered our long. So we, we sold our long. So we're actually, uh, we've been pretty neutral here. It's trending bearish. As, as I mentioned, as long as we're below 4390, it's hard to see a case for the, 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 the market to, um, not sell rallies. So we're we're within 50 points of that level. We could easily see another four or 5% drop, but I think dips are still going to be bought over the medium term and, and going into the year end, especially as uh, you know, the Fed situation becomes a little bit more clear. Um, on the on the commodities front, it's been a fantastic year. We've been crude oil itself and natural gas have been extremely profitable. Um, you know, we've been bullish of crude oil now. We, we, we've been calling for close to 90 now, but um, we're, we're, pro, we're back above 80. We were approaching 85 last week. There's so many different things going on in the oil and the, the natural gas and, and gold markets. Um, so there's a lot, a lot we cover, but we're, we're largely bullish on commodities. Um, we're we're long, medium term bullish on the S&P, short term kind of bearish now. And then, as I mentioned, the 10 year we think is going to 4.5%. Would you be buying Bitcoin on the dip after today's um, huge sure. sell-off? I think seven to eight percent move in a single day, which is um, even it's rare even for Bitcoin. I think it hasn't happened for years. Uh, I think Bitcoin, on- crypto, crypto as a whole, and Bitcoin particularly has become a product of just risk sentiment. If there's risk appetite in the market, crypto is golden. So. We're, our view is that um, crypto and the, like Bitcoin and the S and P are actually are actually moving together. I mean, if you if you chart them, to the, it's 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 almost like they move exactly. To, you know, and then the drop that you are explaining that happened seven seven to eight percent in ten minutes yesterday after the close, um, that was an more of a liquidity event, which is interesting because we've seen liquidity events in crypto earlier this year, and typically these liquidity events follow or precede um, a a period of volatility in the equity markets. And now we're seeing the S&P down. So maybe that was just a sign of liquidity starting to dry up after such a sharp move higher. It's like we said with the S&P, you might see another, uh, you might see a short-term correction, but also we think Bitcoin's heading back to 30,000 plus. Uh, that's on the assumption that the S&P is also going to rise? Absolutely. Yep, exactly. So that's on the assumption that risk, risk appetite is here to stay over the medium term. Um, especially once, I think after the September Fed meeting, we'll have a lot more clarity as to what the Fed's going to do. I, 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 well, okay, that makes sense. But we got to talk about what's happening this week. Um, sentiment this week for the risk assets is not good. Uh, hmm. S&P is headed for a straight third week of losses. It's, it's the worst streak since March, actually. Uh, actually, worst week since March. And uh, I, I just wonder what it's responding to any specific macro events coming out of the U S or the world that would perhaps spark a sell-off this week. I think it's, it's a lot of it is due to the, the, the shifts in the bond market that we've been discussing. Um, I think it's also a very technical pullback after a sharp move higher, you need a correction. I mean, you can't, the markets don't move in a straight line and once 4390 was broken, you saw selling accelerate this week. It's not necessarily any huge macro issues. Earnings have been pretty strong in the second quarter. Um, you are seeing a little bit of weakness in the retail sector, but nothing crazy. Um, and I think it's just markets pricing in a longer Fed pause at that 525 to 550 basis point Fed funds rate. And once that's priced in, then you actually have more upside potential in the S&P because if the Fed starts to cut earlier, I mean, we don't see a case where the Fed's not cutting in 2024. Right now we're in mid-2024 and that's when rate cuts are expected to start. It's it's even possible that um, futures could be wrong and we shift to cutting in March, which would be a bullish catalyst, right? So I think right now we're pricing in this, this higher for a longer assumption that not more rate hikes, but just a longer pause. And that's kind of warranting the the short term correction we're seeing in, in equities. 
Does does uh, weakness in China have anything to do with this? If you look at uh, first of all, the central bank of China cut rates unexpectedly, yep. uh, but maybe not so unexpectedly. If you just look at the stock market of China, it's been lagging behind the S and P all year. So the, the the investors and traders familiar with the Chinese stock markets are already seeing weakness in the Chinese economy. The question is whether or not this weakness could be transferred or imported into the other parts of the world like the west yeah well the the situation in china where they unexpectedly cut rates by the biggest amount since 2020 um was i think also spooked spooked people a little bit because it's weird you have central banks all around the world are doing a completely exact exactly opposite thing so you have argentina raise rates to 118 percent in the same week that china cut rates and then in the same week that the fed here is saying pause and and hold higher for longer and then inflation in europe is out of control so there's so many different things happening in so many different parts of the world that i think that the the rate cut from china was kind of also a, a little bit of a uh, sign that maybe we've we've just gone rates have gone too high too fast um and at, at the minimum we need to start pausing and markets are worried that higher rates in china especially with this evergrand uh news is are starting to kind of pressure things um not just consumers but also in the commercial sector and um it could it could easily uh spread from there so i think the rate cut was in a way, rate cuts were were bullish because you're like, all right, we have lower rates coming again. But in, in, in on another another hand, it's like, are they cutting rates because they're already in a recession, or they're seeing such so much economic weakness? Um, so I think it just kind of got everyone out of that risk on mode to kind of double double guessing what what's happening. So if if America enters a recession, we can assume that American consumers will demand less goods, which may impact China. Can the reverse be applied? It could um, definitely. I mean, China's the industrial, you know, the production giant of the world, and I think, and the way the economy is now, it, it, we're not. It's it's no longer a, a siloed economy. It's a global economy. I mean, even with what you've seen with the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, so stuff that's happening there impacts everybody. Sanctions impact everyone. The, the the grain deal impacts everyone. So it's you'll never really it's hard to have a major world power go into a recession without other other economies of the world feeling it. So I, I definitely think we're we're very intertwined with China, with Europe, with Russia, with everybody. It's a global economy now. We haven't talked about your inflation forecast, which I guess ties into your outlook on Fed policy. Inflation's been coming down. Um, and I know people have been giving me all sorts of flack online. Inflation's not coming down. My prices are still high in the grocery store. No, the price is still high, but the rate of change of prices are coming down. Right. Inflation's been coming down. And so you look at that, you think to yourself, does this is the problem over? Inflation's dead, or perhaps it's going to be sticky. Some people have told me it's going to be sticky towards four percent. What do you think? Yeah. So the the first point, I mean, that's a good point to clarify. When inflation comes down, that's the that's called disinflation, right? It's the rate of inflation slowing. That doesn't mean prices are falling. That just means the rate of of prices increasing is is declining. Uh, we don't have deflation, so we still have it. We're still in a rising uh, rising price environment. Prices are still up sharply over the last two years. Um, so it's that's a good thing to clear up. As far as our forecast, um, core inflation has been more stubborn than headline CPI. I mean, we saw CPI fall to 3%, then rise a little bit to 3.3%. 3 so call it 3.3 3 to 3.3% right now. Um, but the Fed has been very clear that 2% is their inflation target. And I think getting down from three, mid threes to two is more difficult than going from five to three because that, that, it, and and that's what um, if you look at a lot of the major forecasts out there, they we actually there's actually signs that inflation is going to rise into September, and that might might also pressure the Fed. But getting down to two percent is probably going to take some time. It might and we might not see two percent until 2025. I mean, per the Fed's forecast, I mean it could be another year and a half or so or a year um, before we see two percent inflation. So I think persistent. Two to three percent inflation is going to be the norm in 2024. 
And you might even see the Fed start to say, okay, maybe we'll accept 2.5 or something, just because there's going to be so many other factors at play that might warrant rate cuts starting in 24. Well, that, that's a very good point in that uh, the market agrees with your assessment on what the Fed's going to do. The CME Fed Watch Tool is pricing in a 90% chance of no hike by September. I'm just wondering why the Fed's not in a hurry to bring inflation down to 2%. Like you said, it's going to stay sticky above 2%, maybe even closer to 4% if you look at core PCE. That's yep. nowhere clear. No nowhere near their target yeah. wouldn't they be they wouldn't they want to keep raising rates to just you know solve this problem and then move on yeah well the problem with that is so rate hikes generally there's a lag right in in the effect of rate hikes so the recent rate hikes we might not have felt the effect yet the other problem is that if you raise rates too quickly you can, you can kind of think of inflation as like a pendulum right so when it swings too far to one direction then the then it, then it's going to swing back and and like let's just say you swing to high inflation if there's not proper fed policy to intervene that inflationary gap then swings all the way back to a deflationary gap which also in itself is not not the best you don't want inflation or deflation necessarily you kind of want to be somewhere in the middle around that 2% mark um so if the fed raise continues to raise rates uh without really seeing what's happening with the data then they risk the, sending us into a recession. They risk uh, potentially even sparking deflation, which is something that we were worried about as the Fed kept raising rates sharply at the beginning of this year. Um, and I think they're better off right now just saying, okay, we're, we, I mean, we're in a high rate environment right now. We're not, in a, we're not at 3% anymore. Um, why not pause, see what happens, and then we can still take things meeting by meeting. Meeting by meeting is going to be the Fed's approach for the next year at least. They're, not, they're, they're very hesitant to give guidance. And I think that's the right approach. It's just see how the data trends. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to close off on the residential market. We kind of glossed over this uh, in the beginning when we focused on the commercial side. But like you pointed out, uh, the residential side has been doing surprisingly well despite high valuations. You've made numerous tweets about various valuation metrics. This is one. Um, this is not really a metric, but this is something that ev the average person can understand. The average apartment you tweeted is now renting for fifty six hundred dollars in Manhattan, New York. Meanwhile, the average apartment in Brooklyn is renting for forty four hundred dollars. It costs anywhere from fifty two thousand dollars to sixty seven thousand dollars per year to rent the average apartment in Brooklyn or Manhattan. Actually, if you apply the forty uh, x annual income rule, which I think is a is unspoken rule in Manhattan, you've got to make at least one hundred sixty grand a year to be able to afford rent in Manhattan. Yep. That's what yep. basically that yeah. means. So, so you, yeah, what's going yeah. on? It's it's um the so the real estate market and the commercial and the uh, residential side sorry is it actually very strong not necessarily because of high demand because rates are up right so especially for buyers I mean I, that was you're talking about renting but let's just say we're talking about buying you have a seven point five percent thirty year mortgage now I mean that's incredible that's very high that's much well above what we saw even in two thousand eight. Um, but it's so it's not necessarily that it's a demand situation. It's just a supply situation. And um, this is something we've been talking about a lot where there's so many people locked into mortgages in the two, three, four percent range. Um, and for them to sell and move, that would that would in involve their mortgage rate basically doubling, right? So you see they see that first factor where, People don't want to sell purely because they're in a 30 year 2.7% mortgage and there's no reason to, to sell. Um, and with such low supply, any hint of demand has been driving the market higher, especially in a lot of the um, in certain regions of the US. You have seen like in San Francisco and parts of California, you have seen some flight out there. But in, in certain regions, you're seeing just the lack of supply driving things higher. And I know we also talked about housing starts, um, you and I off the camera. The That's why housing starts are so strong. There's new construction is selling because there's not really any, there's not much old supply in the market. And anything that is on the market has been on there for a while. So it's really a supply situation, which we believe you actually are going to need to see rates fall for the housing market to fall. I mean, it's like, it's extremely weird because you would never think that you would think lower rates mean mean um, higher prices. But when rates fall, then you'll have a lot of these people locked in these lower mortgage rates say, OK, you know what? I'll take a four percent mortgage. I'll take a four point five percent mortgage and move. And this and, and then supply will start to return. Well, why do they need to move? Are they, are they trying to lock in profits because their homes went up so much? 
So I, I should I shouldn't say move. I should say um, particularly um, people that are you know a lot of investors have bought properties and and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of not necessarily single family home owners right there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, real estate companies that have invested in this low rate period right a lot of this rent driven stuff is due to developers um, acquiring and building buildings during COVID at, at such low rates right and then. They're also driving. So there's so many different factors with low rates, driving prices higher. But I think the supply for supply to return, you need lower rates. And I think that's the first one of the first times in history that we've seen that happen. So so, so you're in New York right now, right? Yes. OK, so, so let's just <laughs> let, let, what, what's going on right now for renters. We haven't talked about this. I know New York where parts of the city or if not most of the city is rent controlled. And so is there actually a risk of rent going up considerably because valuations are still high? We haven't talked about what this means for the average renter and consumer. Yeah. So the renting thing is there's there, it's almost like there's um, I mean, cities like New York where where renting is more common, uh, uh, you know, yeah, that that's that's a, pl- a factor at play that you mentioned. But it's also just a lot of people that can't afford to buy are now renting. Um, and even now renting has become expensive. So that's something that we've been commenting on. It's like just having a place to live is is like becoming unaffordable for many people um, because the demand of, for, for a lot of buyers are saying, you know what, I'll rent for a couple of years until the market comes down or until I can afford to, to get a lower rate. And then that's driving rents higher across the board. Um, and then, like you said, the underlying property values are going up. So developers are saying, I need to, I need to maintain my cap rate, right? I need to maintain a healthy return that justifies higher rent. And then just inflation as a whole, things have become more expensive. So you, you always, you know, you always see housing market, the housing market's always moving with the, with inflation. So, as well as the rental market. Okay. So the average person, what you're saying in, in, a, in a big city um, is facing potentially higher rent, uh, they're facing infl- well, they have faced inflation. Prices are still high. Uh, they're facing also higher credit card debts for most people. Uh, you put up a chart. Delinquency rates on credit cards have been going up. What does this mean for yeah. for for the average person facing all these forces? Yeah, that's something that we've been concerned about. Is every, there's so many different ways that debt is being piled on for consumers from credit card. I mean, credit card debt just hit a record one trillion. You have total household debt at seventeen point one trillion, another record, and then auto loans one point six trillion. Then you have student loans returning. Student loan payments. There's another one point six trillion of student loans. Um, the payments start are returning another uh, month and a half. So there's so many different. Uh, sources of debt that consumers are being bogged down by um, and rates are rising simultaneously. So we think consumer discretionary income is is, is going to continue to pull back. And that's really why retail has been kind of weak. Um, so for the consumer, I mean, it's it's right now is kind of the exact opposite of what we saw in 2020. Everyone was was the government handed out four trillion dollars. Now we're paying the price for that through inflation, and higher interest rates. Right. OK. So, yeah, things aren't looking great, but um, it's not terrible either. Let's close off on this, though, because this is like, like this conversation has been highlighting some of the confusion around the markets. On the one hand, we've got all these different forces potentially weighing down on consumer demand. But on the other hand, um, forecasts for GDP are still going to be positive. And the economy right now, especially the labor market, we haven't talked about the labor market yet, but uh, uh, jo- the jobs market looks strong. So you put everything together now. How strong is the economy? Right. So that's that's a great way to end it is that um, the, the economy, we're not on the brink of 08. We're not on the brink of some major collapse. And, and I think that's important to know. I think there are parts of the economy like that we've discussed that are in bear market or or worse territory and that may may feel a collapse but i think overall um the the equity markets first of all remain strong the labor market is strong as you said inflation is coming back down i think over the next year we're going to start to see more stability with interest rates we'll we'll see more of a sweet spot for the fed's fund fed funds rate and then you'll start to see inflation around that two to three percent range um, and will we, we will we see a correction in housing prices? Perhaps you know we might see a ten to twenty percent drop. Will we see equities trading volatility? Absolutely. 
but it's not necessarily uh you know a 2008 huge crash coming situation which i think consumers can be and investors can be pretty happy about i mean it's been it's been everything has been unprecedented since the pandemic started basically and Overall, if I would have told you in 2020, we'd be where we are right now, I think people would say, you know what, I'll take it given the circumstances. So overall, not not incredibly bearish on the economy as a whole. I think it's it's been very resilient. And I just think there's certain pockets of the market and pockets of the economy where there's going to be weakness and it might spill over into other pockets. But overall, it still remains very resilient. So you're not you're not losing sleep over the bearish signals is what you're saying. We're not okay. not yet. <laughs> okay. All right, not yet, not yet. Well, we'll follow up again and see maybe your ch stance change or stay the same um, down the line later this year. Where can we follow your work in the meantime? I mentioned your Twitter several times, but where else? Yeah, so we're on uh, all all social media: Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Cobasi Letter. Um, I think it'll be in the description, and then check out our website, thecobasiletter.com. Uh, for anyone that's interested in receiving all of our analysis, our picks, um, we publish it all there. And, you know, thanks for having us on. It's been it's been great. Great joining you. Yeah, that was a great chat. I hope to speak with you again soon. Follow Adam at uh, the Cobasio Letters links down below. We'll put the links in the description. Thank you very much, Adam, for your time. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.